Oof, okay. <laughs> so it's added 9 plus or Let's go with this one. Oh no! Hi everybody, welcome to Lazy's Academy. Welcome to a new game that just made. Uh, it's called High Stakes. It's been just released on um, Itch.io and on Lexalawful. Uh, and it has been a game that I created during this year's a game by its cover jam. Now, I haven't been posting a lot of videos during this time, sadly. Because as I said, you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> it's very difficult to schedule, <laughs> to schedule uh, at this point uh, stuff for, for me like this. Like, uh, I really wanted to um, at least record um, my work on this game. Um, during during this game jam, but it turned out to be like this very stressful. Like I, I turned out to like I was very late to the party, and I had like literally like my first session where I started working on this game. I, I realized okay, I if I start recording this, I know that I won't be taking advantage of like little t little time slots that I have to draw my day like half an hour. Like for half an hour, I won't set up you know my lights and everything. And, and so I will have actually less time developing the game if I try to record everything. So I decided not to record stuff, uh, just to give you more ch better chances to actually finish this game. And it was still very, very close. So anyway, this is High Stakes. So um, it has been a game that I created in collaboration with Gruber Music, with the excellent Gruber Music. Uh, I reached out to him very on a very short notice at the end of the, of the game jam, and he jumped in, and he was such a such a trooper. Like he uh, made multiple uh, versions of the music here, and and we really worked really hard on this. Um, but yeah, yeah, he uh, created this beautiful music on here. We did some really nice special tricks, um, special effects that I won't discuss later on. We made my like top ten list of, of the cards or like my favorite cards from this year. And I had like I was going back and forth on a lot of them, but I eventually just like went with my gut feeling. And this is high stakes. I really love this very visually striking something that immediately like spoke to me. Um, and um, yeah, that was one of my problems. I, I had like a lot of cards that had really good ideas this year, where I was like, ah oh, man, I should do this something like this. But then the cards were like not quite, you know, hitting it out of the park. And I always want to, if I make a card for uh, a game by its cover jam, I always want to use the actual cover art and be as close to the actual cover art as possible and use the actual cover art, you know, in promotion and so forth. Um, so sometimes there's a really good idea for a game, but the cover is a little bit not taking it quite as seriously. So it's a, always a bit of a pity. Um, just to, for you people who don't know what it is, um, so a game by its cover is this um, jam. There is this, <laughs> I always have to explain, there is this um, huge exhibition called um, uh, Famicase, My Famicase, it's in Japan. And uh, you can send in, like every year, game designers from all over the world can send in designs for cartridges and for like um, super, uh, NES cartridges and they print those NES cartridges put them on the actual cartridges and exhibit them in a little store in, in, in Tokyo and that's a, this exhibition and they create like a little website and a, and a magazine displaying all the cards and um, and then later on, completely unrelated <laughs> people create this a game by its cover jam, uh, and uh, then you are the, all the game developers all over the world are tasked to create the games to those fake cartridges that that game designers have, or visual designers have created. So yeah, this is um, this is a game that was created based on a fake cartridge. So this video is going to be a bit of me rambling a lot, because kind of like to make up for all the missing content <laughs> about this game just like appeared out of nowhere. Uh, I had some people asking questions about uh, on on, Re on uh, Reddit, asking questions about you know, okay, how this, did this game came to be? Um, so I want to like ramble a little bit about the game design process, about you know how I came to create this game, um, and maybe play it a little bit, just maybe to explain before we like start you know talking about this. So this is the game. I'm going to start a new game. There's a new intro that I later included. An average human, an average human body it contains about 500 milliliters, uh, 5,000 milliliters of blood. <laughs> oh no, where did all the blood go? <laughs> Don't take it to heart, you are living on borrowed time anyway. Here, the last shot is on me, it will take the edge off. Or maybe you can win it all back, how about it, one last game. So you've given a shot glass of, uh, of, <laughs> of your own blood back. Uh, vampires have stolen all your blood and you've, uh, they give you a shot glass back. 
and you're um, playing a gambling game against them and you're supposed to win back all of your blood. I actually had to google <laughs> how much a shot glass is. Turns out it's not 20 milliliters in, in America, but it is in Germany, so I just decided to go to Germany because 20 milliliters would actually be a good number to start the game with. Right, so let's let's start. Um, so this is the first vampire that you fight, and this is a game about flipping cards. You've dealt nine cards, and you're supposed to flip over as many cards as you can without flipping over one card that's bad. That's the vampire card. You've been dealt one vampire card and eight value cards ranging from two to eight. Uh, and there's just one copy of each card on the board, and it's always the same cards every every turn. But they're of course in different positions. And so you about you're supposed to flip over the cards, and but you never have. If you flip over the vampire, you lose um, lose the round. And if you flip all of the cards except the vampire, then you win the round. Uh, and also at any given point, you can also pass, which means you walk away with some of the winnings, but not all of them. And the winnings are like you see the stakes at the bottom. If I flip over a card you would see that the stakes go up. So as, as I flip over cards, uh, I will get more stakes. And also, if you listen to the music in the background, it's dynamic music. So as I flip over cards, the music gets more dramatic and more layers are get, getting added to the music. That's the, one of the technical cool things that we added. Maybe more on this, on this later on. So yeah, so far it's a, like a pure game of chance. You just flip over the cards and you know, whatever. But there's like one twist to this, of course, uh, and that's the, or like multiple twists. And that's these, um, token cards, they tell you, um, they give you kind of like hints on what the cards could be. So this is a 3 plus, and that means this card that is underneath this token is a 3 or higher. And this is a 9 plus, so the card underneath is a 9 or higher. Now the cards go from 2 to 9, and the vampire is a 10. So this card is either the vampire or the 9. So this is obviously a you know, very risky card to flip over. And uh, while well, this is a relatively low risk card, so I can flip it over. But one thing you can also do is because you start with like those two uh, two tokens on the board. But one thing you can additionally do is if you uh, complete a row of of cards or a column of cards, you will unlock additional tokens that you can put somewhere on the board. So I can, for example, this token. I unlock this one because there were three on the bottom here. I can put it in here, and now I know uh, that's seven plus. That's pretty risky. I'm gonna go for it. All right, got it. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah, and this unlocks that token and so forth. So you can see this is um, we have like this intermediate goals. So let's see. Let's see if we can win win this um, this match. So uh, let's see if we can win this round for for now. I'm gonna assume. Oh, okay. So now it's clear. I flip over a nine, and this is a nine plus token. So it can't be the nine because there's just one copy of the nine on the board. So it has to be the vampire. So I flip all, all over the cards except from the vampire. It stabs the vampire, and whatever I had my stakes, <clears throat> now that gets added to the winnings. And because I evaded the vampire, I get two additional milliliters. So as you can see, I got ten milliliters in the bank already. Right, that's pretty good. And and here, beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. Uh, Showing off another feature here. There's a stake on the left side, and you can just take, grab that stake, and just stab a card. And if you get it right, if you stab the vampire, then you get additional milliliters, additional bonus points. And you can see this is going to be 13 plus whatever you have right now. So it's uh, and plus two. So it's always 16. It should be 16. I think it's always 16. Oh man, I'm forgetting my own game. It should be 16. Yeah, it's 16. Yeah, one flip card to vampire for evading vampire and the step on is 13. In this case, I was sure that this was a vampire because, and again, there was a 9 flipped over and a 9 plus token. So that means that uh, that was a vampire. Um, there's uh, different types of tokens in here as well. So, for example, here now I unlocked uh, like a greater, smaller token. Uh, that um, That's something I can only put on a face up card. So, for example, on a 7 here. And it will show you, like, it will split into, into tokens and it will compare other face down cards to this face up card, so adjacent face down cards to this face up card. And it will show me if the number on that face down card is lower or higher. So in this case, it's higher. So this is a safe card to turn around. This one is an 8 or a 9, so this is a, not a safe card to turn around. And actually, this is a 7 and this is a 7 plus. So this, oh, these two cards are very sus. These are super sus. This one is fine. Um, all right, so let's continue. Okay, 
another compare card. Now this token now doesn't really help me that much because I'm worried about those two. That's, and actually now this this also could be could be bad. Okay, so it's either either here or here we have the vampire. We have a bunch of tokens, but they don't really help me that much because if I put them here, I know that's bigger because one of those is a nine, the other one is a vampire. Hmm. It's a gambling game, you know. <laughs> Uh, and that's kind of like an important design decision, something I will talk about later. I, I, I didn't want this to be a Sudoku, where you can always find it out, find out, you know. Uh, or the Minesweeper, where if you start guessing, you will lose the game, you know. <laughs> okay. So, uh, also this is something I also want to talk about, how um, um, sometimes you... The first card you flip is the is the vampire and the lose immediately. But in this case, it's not too bad because just two milliliters, right? The stakes get higher as you continue playing throughout the round. So getting a vampire early means that you lose very little. Getting a vampire late is where you where the big losses come. All right. So um, at the bottom left corner, you see how many uh, of the rounds we have won in this match, and we have won three rounds. So we're gonna have an opportunity to participate in a bonus round on the end. Oh wow, that was lucky. Nine and eight flip over here. Oof. Is that a seven? That's a seven. That's good. Yeah, it would be good to get. Oh, see. Mm. So this is a vampire, right? Gotcha! Alright, so now I can do a bonus round. <laughs> I'm gonna go for it, whatever. <laughs> so I can double my winnings. And I have pretty high winnings. So that's good. But also if I lose this round, I lose the game. And you can see there is no stake here and I, I cannot pass anymore. So this is just like, you know, pure gaming. Okay, um... Sure. Okay. So this is okay. Why did I do this? <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, that's fine. Uh, this is this is excruciating. Okay. Let's not flip over this one. Oof. Okay. <laughs> so it's either nine plus or seven. Let's go with this one. Oh no! <laughs> what the heck? I lost everything. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, at the end of the match, uh, your winnings get added to your repository of blood or subtracted. In this case, nothing happened. <laughs> this is the best when it's like there's so much on the, on, on the line and you lose it all. Okay, so um, now why did I make this game? Or, like, or let's let's talk a little bit about, about some of the like how I developed the idea for this game, how, how I developed the, uh, how I came up with this game generally. Um, you know, um, I did a lot of research for this, so um, I actually wanted to do like two weeks of research, uh, and then you know have like four weeks because the game jam is actually four weeks, like one month, but actually they always add two weeks at the end, and I was kind of counting on this. So uh, I, I wanted to have like split the initial four weeks in half and half, so like two weeks for research and two weeks for development, and then you know I, I get an initial two weeks at the end, so four weeks for development, I guess. Uh, but it ended up to be four weeks of development. Like I spent an entire month just um, uh, researching and, and, and developing a prototype. And then, um, you know, just like, I, when my idea was like, I prepare everything, I just figure out what the game is, and it's just like, you know, steamroll through the development, which worked out, but also it wasn't really fun. <laughs> it was very, uh, I had to do a one-nighter, uh, all-nighter, and at my, my age, that hurts, you know. Uh, yeah. So some assumptions, or some ideas that I had, like, uh, as I went into this game and started developing it. Um, it, it's a game, uh, or it's a game type I don't like, uh, and <laughs> so that's a that's a good challenge, right? So I don't like gambling, and especially I don't like games where um, your your like your core mechanic is luck based. Um, and uh, there's many reasons why you you would dislike this, but um, for me it's. Um, well, first of all, let's talk about... I, I don't like gambling games like games that you play in a casino for money. Uh, I don't think these are good games. Um, and I don't mean it as a disrespectful way. Like, I, I don't mean that if you play those games you're an idiot or something. But I... Like, if those games 
didn't have the gambling part, it didn't have the money part, you wouldn't play them. Right? You wouldn't, like, on a family board game evening, you wouldn't whip out a roulette wheel. It's like, let's play roulette today! <laughs> As that would be like, come on, like oh, there's nothing there, right? Playing with paper money and roulette makes no sense, or, or blackjack. It's the it's the money that that uh, makes the game interesting. Um, and also the games themselves are there's not much of a game there, and that's by design, right? You if you go to a roulette table, there's not there's that you do nothing, you just bet. Or if you go to blackjack, you like all you can do is just like get a card or or not. And that's it. And then there's the betting. Uh, and in, during the research of this, on this, I also played like a lot of casino games, and I, I hate poker. <laughs> and there's some poker version that I like, but I just discovered that I really hate uh, the Texas Hold'em type of poker because there's nothing there. <laughs> there's just like I don't know. There's just like you see cards, and automatically more cards get revealed, and as more cards get revealed. You get to bet on it, and all of the decisions that you do in poker are about betting, and none of them are about you know changing the board state or you know manipulating board state or pursuing some strategy. You know, there's nothing. There's nothing there. You just cards get revealed automatically, no matter what you do, and you can just bet on those cards. Um, and in many ways, it's it's by design, obviously, because if you go to a casino, like think about. Why are we? Don't we have more complicated games in the casino, or like games where you can do strategy or where skill makes matters, right? Well, you don't have them because if you go to a casino, first of all, you want to be to as accessible to everybody as possible because you want to casino owners want to pull money out of the people going into casinos, so they don't want, don't want to put any barriers in between you playing and losing your money and you know participating in the casino. So if you have a game that you have to learn the rules that are complicated, then that's not a good casino game. So they make a casino game where it's like you literally have to just like a statue would be able to play this game, right? You can just sit there and, and do nothing and you would be playing the game. And then that's Texas Holder. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't want to go. I know poker is a very popular uh, game. I don't want to uh, disrespect you. It's, if you like poker, that's fine. Um, yeah, so you have like these games, you know, again, like where it's like you, there, you have to do a bare minimum, you have to breathe, and then you were already playing, be playing this game. You don't have to learn the rules, there's just like the decisions are very simple and straightforward. And the other reason why I don't like um, uh, casino game or game, gambling style of games is because they often um, rely on so called operate. Um, operant conditioning to make uh, to make them interesting or engaging. So operant conditioning is kind of like um, part of this behaviorism, 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 behaviorism. Okay, just want to make sure that, <laughs> that I'm not, not uh, mispronouncing it. Um, so it's kind of like a, I guess, a philosophical, uh, psychological theory, uh, pretty outdated and very very much disputed or like problematic, let's say. Um, you might be familiar with this um, Pavlov's dog experiment where a researcher, you know, every time he fed a dog, he would ring a bell and the dog would eventually learn to associate the bell with food. So then he would ring the bell without bringing the dog food and the dog would salivate. Um, and you might be, no, I, I, you might be familiar with this same effect where, you know, you have like a certain um, uh, iPhone uh, alarm tone as you wake up. Uh, alarm bell, and then you hear it in other, some other context, like in a movie or something, and your heart starts, pound, heart starts pounding because that's how you wake up every day. Well, that's the, kind of like the same situation here, right? And so, operant conditioning is kind of like um, like a follow up to this. Um, how can we use um, this kind of training um, where you know animals or humans learn to associate certain things with reward or punishment to um, change their behavior? And uh, one very famous example of that, or like one guy who pushed it very far, was um, a guy called B.F. Skinner. And he created so called, or he did research into reward schedules. So, how can you associate a certain action um, with a reward or uh, punishment, but depending on a certain 
certain rhythm or logic and how which of those rhythms or logic or what you call schedules are most effective at manipulating behavior of animals but also people I guess. Uh, and so what he found out is that the most effective pattern is a um, random reward schedule. So if the thing that the animal does and the reward are um, uh, random to each other. So the idea is that, you know, um, a rat would press, uh, would be in a cage and they would press, press a little button and a food pellet would come out. That's the reward, right? You press a button and a food pellet comes out. And so the rat gets rewarded for pressing the button. Uh, and so the rat will learn that pressing a button is good and he will start mashing the button and getting the food pellets. But um, the way you can make the rat push the button even harder and even more frequently is by making it so that um, sometimes the, there would be no pellet coming out. And sometimes, you know, we have to press five times and then the one, randomly one foot pellet come out. So like, it, it wouldn't be like a one-to-one -one association with pressing a, the button and the foot pellet come out, but you, the rat wouldn't know when the, ne when the next pellet would come out. So you would like, press the button a lot to make the foot come out, right? Um, and if you listen to this, you might be familiar with this, like in from all sorts of different situations in video games, right? Where it's like you have like loot, for example, right? You are fight monsters and you kill the monsters, and sometimes very bad loot com comes out, but every now and then really good loot comes out, and then you're like, oh. Um, so yeah, that's operant conditioning, and um, this kind of stuff is very problematic, very, very, very controversial. Um, because it's it's there is an ethics problem here. Um, it's a very well known phenomenon, very well known structure that you can use to manipulate the behavior of people uh, to do to make them do things that they might not want to do. So like um, you know, for rats, I guess not a big deal. But if you make a person do something uh, compulsively and obsessively, is that is that good? Like they probably shouldn't do that. Like that's maybe <laughs> maybe you should ask the person before and if they like that or not. Um, yeah, probably not giving the problem here a lot of justice, but yeah, it's, it's a bit of a creepy thing to do. Um, but for game designers, I think like the most, um, the least um, controversial takeaway is that if you rely on operant conditioning to for your game to be fun and engaging, then maybe the game itself is actually crap. Um, but as a game designers, we should design things that are engaging by, by itself without any kind of reward structures associated with it. Ideally, so the activity itself should be rewarding and interesting and not like with some kind of reward structures. And you know, a lot of the discussions that we have in the game community uh, about ethical game design and so forth um, actually circles around these kind of topics. You have stuff like gacha games, which are, you know, open conditioning the game. <laughs> Where it's like, you know, we have Genshin Impact these days, where it's like, you can pay some money to do the wish, and most of the time you get nothing, but sometimes you get a really good anime girl, and then that's how they make you spend you know, hundreds of money. And if you like think about it, this, this structure that we just described here is obviously like a slot machine, right? You just pull a lever, and most of the time you lose money, but every now and then, randomly, you will get some money, and that's how you, they make you, you know, push the lever over and over again. So yeah, that's creepy and bad and you shouldn't do it as a game designer and that's why I generally dislike any kind of like randomness uh, as part of a, um, um, of a core game mechanic. So that's why, for example, in Pork Like I was against making my attack patterns be based on random number rolls um, because that would be also um, operant conditioning and I distrust, I generally distrust operant conditioning because it, it is effective, it works sometimes and then if it works and I cannot um, be sure if it if the game is fun because of that reward structure or if it's fun by itself, you know. And you know, you can still add that later on if you want to, but you want to make sure that you have like a base game mechanic that is fun by itself. So yeah, I dislike gambling. I dislike gambling games, but this is a gambling game, so this was my like foray into gambling games, and I think that there's like this um, a good current argument of every now and then dipping into genres or topics that you don't really like um, to kind of like gain experience from it, like to kind of understand, maybe appreciate some other aspects of it. And so this was my foray into gambling, to kind of understand gambling. 
So another way for me to like get into the topic of gambling is also I'm fascinated with a certain type of genre of anime. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to be out myself as a huge weeaboo. I'm very interested in niche genres that I'm that you wouldn't like that are not like traditional genres that are kind of like very specific interest genres. And there is a specific interest genre called the gambling genre in anime which is very, very good and very fascinating. Uh, there's not too many entries of it. I think the most important um, entries in that genre is um, an anime called Kakegurui. I probably butchered this. Kakegurui. Um, it's on Netflix. Uh, in this, actually, there's manga, there's an anime, there's like a live action TV series, there's also like, like two live action movies. There's That's a big, big series. And, and there's another one called um, Kaiji um, by a guy called Nobuyuki Fukumoto. Uh, and this guy is actually very prolific in creating the genre and pushing it. He made multiple mangas and do, who are turned into anime. Uh, Kaiji is the most important one or the biggest one, uh, there, but there's also Akagi, but that's more focused on a very specific game, um, on the game of Mahjong. So what is a um, gambling anime, or a gambling manga, I guess? Uh, it is kind of like a show where uh, the protagonists are gambling, uh, and in, in incredibly high-stakes games, uh, and there's like like ridiculous um, huge uh, you know, stakes grinding on a line. So in Kaiji, there's like multiple situations where like literally body parts are on the line. And I think in Kukakaguri as well, like yeah, like they would bet like fingers and, and body parts and you know, play uh, Russian roulette and stuff like that. And stuff like that. Um, but also like other things like in Kakaguri you have all, um, it's like this ridiculous idea of a, like a gambling high school where uh, there's multiple situations where like you you bet your entire life on the line where you like you give somebody like a, you basically become a slave of somebody right and they can like decide what your life will be which you know is a very political statement there as well <laughs> so that's that's very interesting part of it like the political aspect of you know um, power imbalance that's something that really appealed to me in this in these genres um, um, but there's another aspect is of course there's a certain horror part like um, the horror of seeing people in this impossible situations and and trying to get out of situations or or like uh, you know being afraid like being afraid of losing something that uh, is is lost forever and they cannot get back or losing it just just generally losing a lot right um, and dealing with that loss or this danger of loss um, that that seems to me like. Um, something that is very uh, near the horror genre without being actual horror. Like, there's nothing scary happening in this, in this game. This, this scariness is the concept of losing a lot. Um, and like, in crazy amount of, of like, so something that's, that will completely change your life, right? And, you know, like, your entire life is on the line on one card flip, on one roll of a die. Like, there's little things that, are, that can have huge repercussions on the rest of your life. Um, so, or... And being in debt, being denied your uh, normal life, and, and trying to get back into your normal life, and that's kind of like a big part of, of those of those um, of those um, of the genre. And there's another part as well, which is kind of like seems almost um, like a very different side of the coin, and that is like the technical uh, strategy part, the detective part. Like these people are in these crazy um, games, and they try to crawl back, you know, kind of win against all odds. And um, kind of, uh, they try to analyze the strategy of those games and how they can uh, get an upper hand in an impossible situation. So quite often, um, the protagonists of those games actually find themselves in a situation where they're losing the game um, and where maybe the opponent is even cheating. And so they're trying to get like get behind, the, uh, like understand it to how the cheating works and how can they can get an advantage. Uh, from the fact that they know the opponent is cheating, Kakaguru is very well known for like like this, does it really well I think where every time the protagonist you know she likes gambling she's like this compulsive gambler and she's playing those antagonists and they always cheat and what she always does is like she removes the cheating aspect like she makes them actually play for real. Uh, 
and um, kind of like um, um, scares them by being this old compulsive gambler by going by actually voluntarily uh, engaging in this in this high stakes games, whereas they were pretending they were playing the game but they were actually cheating. Um, so uh, yeah, so there's like these two parts, like the horror part and the technical strategic part that I really find very appealing. So, and a third thing that I, I had like coming into this project is, um, we discussed this in a Discord actually, um, I played a lot a game called Netrunner, which was the game uh, created by Richard Garfield, the creator of Magic the Gathering. And after he created Magic the Gathering in the 90s, he created a second card game called Netrunner. And that is by many people considered the better card game. That's, that's kind of like an improved Magic the Gathering. And generally a, a fascinating, complicated, but also incredibly well-designed game. Uh, and I played this a lot competitively for a couple of years. Uh, it, um, it came out in the 90s, then it got like axed, uh, it got uh, discontinued. It was then revived recently in uh, 2000 something, 2012, I think. And then it got discontinued again, <laughs> not far, not long time ago. So right now it's being, um, you know, uh, there's a community still playing it and holding up the torch, but it's now like largely player driven. Shout out to Team Nisei. Um, yeah, so um, this um, this card game is something that I, I I think about a lot because it has a lot of very interesting mechanics that you don't really see anywhere in um, in games. And one of them is like this um, that I, I I'm always thinking about how to get this Netrun experience, how to maybe capture some of the aspects of Netrun that, that I found interesting about Netrun, how to capture them in a maybe single player experience. And we were discussing this a little bit in the Discord, you know, how that could look like. Um, but yeah, so this was maybe an opportunity for me to do that a little bit, to kind of get some of the ideas of Netrunner. Um, and I didn't go f too far with that, but I had like this idea that, you know, it would be f something that you do quite often in Netrunner is you, there's a face down card and then you turn it around and depending on what that card is, you can either lose or win the game. There's often like these kind of like decisive moments where it's really all about what's underneath this card. And there's all sorts of like information that you get from different sources that give an idea what this card could be, uh, but you never know until you find out, right? Um, and so like, I really like that one, that part of Netrunner, like gathering information and then you know, deciding whether you want to flip that card or not. And maybe, you, or maybe flip some other cards, like multiple cards there and you would decide which card to flip, like this kind of uh, hat game, basically. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so um, so that's something I also wanted to like had an idea like going into this uh, research project. So yeah, I also did some. I, there's some games that also influenced me that kind of like was thinking about like were in the back of my mind. Uh, one is if you maybe know about this. Uh, this is a game called The Game. <laughs> It's a really good name. So you can actually see it. it actually already looks a little bit like high sticks, right? It has like this red skull, this red black uh, design. I really like actually design. It's it's a bit cheesy, but um, I don't know. It's it goes for it, and, and I think it works out. Well. These are German-made games, and these are the mo like as, as far as the components go, oh, they're really boring to some extent. Like there there's dozens of games like this from German developers, and they all like inside there's just like old cards with numbers. It's a, it's very German this way. It's just cards with numbers. It's just a deck of cards with cards um, going from one to one hundred. That's it. And there's like again multiple games with different theming. A very well known one is uh, called Horn Ox. I will put up all links to, to those games uh, up there. Um, and I kind of like those games because I actually probably could like release one deck of cards going from 1 to 100 and then just like release different rule sets without having to reprint the cards because it's always just like a deck of 1 to 100. Um, um, I like this one because it's it's kind of like it's it's um, again it's um, tries to paint itself as being something dangerous you know the dark souls the end, you know like oh you engaging this very hardcore gritty there's a lot at stake you know oh this that game play the game of your life and so forth um, so that's something that was in the back of my mind it's also like a very simple game it's, it's just like a very simple again very simple cards with just like numbers on them and some rules and uh, you're trying to achieve something together with your friends. But this is like a multiplayer game. Another game that's also inspired by is um, Love Letter, this one. 
it comes like in this little sack. This one is interesting, it's by a Japanese developer. Um, it's, it's a very popular game. This one is interesting because it has very little cards. It has just like cards. Um, it has nine cards in total. Uh, you don't really see it because my focus is really bad. Um, yeah, but it has like nine different types of cards. Just one to nine numbered from 1 to 9. The rules for this are a bit more complicated, um, but like the amount of, the, there's very low amount of um, components to this game. And that's fascinating because it's like a four-player game that's a very deep and rich experience. And so I was I, I was fascinated by this, by this like game with very few components that this creates like a rich experience. So I started out, so these were like these my, the things that I had in my head going into the development. And I started out um, researching uh, solitaire games. Because my initial idea was I actually got here like a... I ordered actually a deck of cards to play solitaire games. Um, I knew that there are some bunch of books out there with different solitaire variants, and then my my initial idea was like, I want to pick a variant of solitaire that's a very compact, like you can display on a on a Pico 8 screen, and then I'm just going to implement that simple variant of solitaire, and then I'm going to do a little twist somewhere, you know, a vampire twist, where it's like you play the solitaire game but all of the aces are vampires and if you uncover the vampire then you lose the game or something like this you know that was my vague idea or maybe you can uncover the vampire you don't lose the game if you uncover a stake card and you can put the stake card on the vampire to kill the vampire you know some, something like stakes and vampires and sometimes you uncover a card and lose the game that was that's something I, I, I was like having in my mind while I was like researching the different types of solitaire. And I downloaded a bunch of apps, solitaire apps on my iPhone as well, and played a little bunch of solitaire apps to see, you know, how solitaire works. Funny enough, yeah, Mike Bithel, <laughs> as I was working on, on High Stakes, Mike Bithel released the solitaire game, so I was like, ah! <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's sound, it, it, it felt like somebody was developing the same game that I was developing. Um, it's really good. It's called a Solitaire Conspiracy, Conspiracy and it's, it's a really fun game. You should try it. Um, so yeah, I was researching Solitaire and it turned out to be a bit of a dead end um, because I didn't. I found some compact Solitaire variants, but they weren't fun. They weren't really good. There's a lot of really bad Solitaire cards um, games out there. Um, obviously, I was reading books from the 1800s, right? <laughs> So, uh, some of the games there weren't really that good. Uh, I found that a lot of the solitaire games were actually pretty automatic. Like you had some rules in which you would move cards around, and there were no decisions to, for you to make. You just like move the cards around to certain rules, and at the end you had a sorted deck. It was like this very complicated way to sort the deck. Not really what I was looking for. Uh, and again, I didn't like a lot of the variants, especially compact variants of Solitaire. And I realized, um, and that maybe was a good takeaway that um, uh, that helped me later on. So it's never, you know, all the research, it's never lost. You always have some kind of um, insights here. Um, so I noticed that Klondike Solitaire, the standard Solitaire that was in Windows 3.1, you know which one if you played Solitaire, the one with the, you know, with the, with the staircase kind of pattern. Um, that's the best one that I, I like the most. And the re there's two reasons for it. Um, there's a bunch of hidden card components that, that's really fun to me. Like um, there's also like free cell, but all of the cards are uncovered and it gets like very, you know, very mind thinking oriented. You have to really think very far ahead. You have to develop all those strategies and that didn't really feel, at least for this game, didn't feel feel like in, in, in the spirit of, of high stakes, you know. Mm. Um, but um, Klondike is really fun because you have, you, f you don't have, um, the complexity is reduced because um, there's a lot of hidden cards in those in those staircase pattern. Um, but also um, because you have the staircase patterns, you there is like a dynamic, a shifting dynamic in the game. There's like sub goals. You try to di remove the different columns, different um, piles of cards, and there's cards of different length. The pa card piles of different sizes, so it's easy to remove the short pile and it's more difficult to, to remove the long pile so you get like this in intermediate goals right like you can remove the short pile very quickly but then removing the long pile it's going to be more difficult so and once you remove all of the piles the game shifts again and now you're no longer removing the piles now you're trying to get things out of the, the draw pile so there's like this um, shifting dynamic and intermediate goals that you're trying to achieve which um, which I felt was very interesting and it felt like the game has a has a dramaturgy going on, like there's a dramatic development throughout, throughout a, a, uh, a 
around, which I was I thought was good and I felt was missing with a lot of the other solitaire games I did research. And again, a lot of solitaire is just like, especially on iPhone, it's just like really find the two cards that match and click them and they disappear. Like uh, Mahjong Solitaire is also really bad at this, where it's like literally just find the two tiles that have the same the same picture on them, like whatever. <laughs> it seems like there's no strategy involved. Um, yeah, um, I did some other research into gambling games. Um, so I played a lot, uh, some other gambling games. I was especially interested in um, betting as a mechanic uh, because that's something I don't have, didn't have a real good grasp, and I think didn't really come out very well in uh, in uh, high stakes. Um, so yeah, I got a little bit into uh, Richi Ma Richi Mahjong, and so the um, Japanese Mahjong. So not the solitaire Mahjong variant, but the Japanese solitaire uh, Japanese normal mahjong uh, game because I never understood how mahjong works in China so it's a, maybe a good thing that I, I learn how to play mahjong. Uh, I will eventually I ask some friends, Chinese friends, and I, they will teach me eventually. Um, but also I like to play I play this um, Chinese uh, Japanese variant of it and that also allowed me to enjoy another gambling manga by Nobuyoki Fukumoto uh, that's um, called Akagi which is about playing that Mahjong variant um, and the Japanese Mahjong variant has a very interesting little detail where it's like uh, in Mahjong you're collecting sets uh, of, of symbols whatever and then but when you're one tile away from victory you can like bet that you're gonna win this round and then you cannot do you can just have to wait until you randomly draw into your winning tile uh, but then that puts everybody else on the table like on on the clock right and I thought that was really interesting, like when you know, when you think you know it, then being able to like raise the stakes one more time. And that's kind of like something that we, uh, that I ended up having in, in high stakes. Um, but in order to play Richie Mahjong and also other gambling games, I got the Nintendo Clubhouse collection, which is like uh, on a Switch, there's like a little collection of like board games basically, or like, um, yeah, like Clubhouse games, I guess. Um, that you can play on a Switch, and I thought that was interesting because it's like a um, you know big studio, Nintendo studio, um, making uh, those simple games. I want to see how they make those simple games, how to make uh, make the card games work, you know, how to visualize stuff. I want to see how a, how a good studio does does it, and also like learn some of the games. So that's how I got into Texas Hold'em and realized I hate it. Ugh. Um, so yeah, uh, one um, takeaway from playing some gambling games on Nintendo Clubhouse is that um, a lot of the gambling games have no teeth if the money is re reset <laughs> at the beginning, right? So in Nintendo Clubhouse, if you play Blackjack, for example, you start with a certain amount of money and then you can lose all of the money, even you get like you know, debt and negative money. But at the end of the game, you know, it's nothing. Like you can just restart the game, and you have all your money back. So the losses are not permanent, uh, or you, the, the, the game doesn't track. You know, your how much you win or lose over multiple games. So there is no penalty to always just like go all in on everything. Oh, <laughs> I always record this with uh, uh, Streamlabs OBS, and sometimes just people will subscribe to my channel. Hi. Um. So yeah, I um, I realized that a lot of the games were like, I, you would just always, there's no reason not to go all in on every single bet on those on those gambling games on Nintendo Club Clubhouse, because again, if you lose badly, whatever, just restart, right? Um, and if you, uh, but there's always this potential that you just win a ridiculous amount because you went all in on this, you know, uh, blackjack thing and then you got just the right cards and then, you know, you top the high score list. So in order for gambling to work, uh, I realized, um, or a gambling game to work, your losses have to carry over into subsequent rounds. You have to like have like a uh, money that you carry from one game to another and that you can lose in the in long term. Uh, and there has to be something on the line. Um, if you can just like, you know, bet it all and then lose and restart and lose and restart, then um, you don't don't have to think about long-term strategy. Then then you know you might just as well not have any kind of betting because you will always bet everything. Um, so yeah, 
so these are some of like some of my research stuff. I eventually, um, eventually, I was like a bit disappointed because I thought the solitaire stuff would yield some results. I would have like this little solitaire game, compact solitaire game, and I would like inject a little bit of vampire stuff in it, and there we have it. But it didn't work out. So eventually, I was like, okay, I did all this research. I have to like the month is, is coming to an end. I have to I have to get something going. Mm. So I thought about okay. How compact do I have to be, right? Uh, how how many cards can I put on the screen of Pico 8? And I figured, like, you can, obviously you can do as many cards. I've seen people make solitaire, actually full clone like solitaire on Pico 8. But I want to have the cards to be of a good size. And I figured, like, with the size I was, I was going for, uh, nine cards would be fine. So I was like, okay, let, let's let's start with that. How what can I do with nine cards? Arrange the cards in like in a three by three pattern. And I, I thought, okay, I knew that I want to have a situation where I'm flipping over cards and it might be a vampire. So I, I assumed, okay, maybe there's one vampire card and the other cards are safe, and then you're not supposed to flip over the vampire. Okay, so doing that, that was good, but it was still a bit random. So I thought about, okay, how can you maybe? And that was like kind of like this. Um, this big challenge, how can you reveal something about hidden information without actually spelling out the hidden information? So that's always a big problem that was really well done in, in Netrunner, where you get all these hints and, and you could like find out something, you could probe into different different aspects of the game to kind of get, gather information. Um, so yeah, that was a bit of a challenge. Um, the hint tokens were kind of like a big deal that I eventually came up with. Like, what if there's like something that tells you you know, this card is this or higher or lower. Um, and I experiment with different kinds of tokens um, to reveal different types of information, but there's like, that's something that always I struggle with a little bit. How can you, again, uh, there's like, with, with, there's something hidden from the player. You, how can you give the player an idea of what this thing could be without just plainly saying it, right? Or because it's very easy to like it's it's a slippery slope. If you just reveal just a little bit of information, the player can often just because they're smart, they can often just deduce what it is. Um, so yeah, that's a bit, bit of a bit of a bit of a difficult thing. Um, I eventually figured that like um, or something I want to like look in or think about more in the future is like it's never just one hint, like the, the, a lot of useless hints can combine into, into actually um, being this interesting puzzle to figure out. So, for example, um, the hint tokens themselves never actually tell you flat out, here, this card is a vampire, right? You can never put a token on a card that t t uh, straight tells you that's a vampire. You always have, the, for example, a 9+, plus. that could be 9 or the vampire, you never know. But if um, you get information from somewhere else, and then you combine the two informations, then you you can actually narrow it down that, that tightly. So the token itself won't tell you, but some other information will will give you additional information to narrow it even further down. So again, um, counting cards, you know, like being able to see, ah, the 9 is already flipped over, and this has to be a 9 or a 10, so it can't be the 9 because the 9 is already flipped over, so it has to be the 10. So like these kind of situations. A lot, a lot of useless information amounts to more than uh, just the sum of it, it, its parts. So yeah, that was a bit of a strategy. I, I to be honest, I'm like, uh, I if I want to make a sequel or like make a you know high quality um, game out of it, I would really have to maybe sit down and think about more mechanics to get more information, like more tokens types, maybe to some some different dimensions of the game as well. So if you have any suggestions on what to do here, I would certainly open. Some people suggested in a Discord suggested doing some mathematics additions. Mm -hmm. And I had some ideas there. I tried out some ideas, but um, I never, uh, I never got something that that was as ambiguous as what as, as was right now. Because I really like the fact that you know you can the tokens themselves can never flat out tell you without any additional information. So yeah, I had the, the tokens then, and initially, believe it or not, initially I had this idea that the game would start with a token on every card, uh, and and I realized very quickly that um, that was very uh, obvious, like um, because uh, additionally, you don't know that now, but in the previous version, it was like um, not only the cards were going from two to eight, and then the vampire, but also the tokens would go from plus two token to a plus nine token, and there would be only one type of token 
on the board uh, every time. So there would be just one nine plus token. Um, and if there was, you know, all the tokens were on the board, you can always, like it was 50% 50, 50 of the time, the nine plus token would be the vampire. So it was really just like, do I stab the nine plus token or not? <laughs> It was like really, it was the game was the same every time. So um, and by the way, the tokens are still generated the same way. So um, it's basically all of the tokens are generated. Like what kind of token will be on each card is decided at the beginning of the game before you put any tokens on it. And whenever you put a token, uh, like the plus tokens, on the card, we basically just reveal a token that was there all along. So there can be at still just one nine plus token on the board at any given time and 9 plus token therefore is still an indicator that this might be a vampire a strong indicator this might be a vampire because if I just randomize the tokens every time I you know put a token on there then you know and there is no reason why the 9 plus token would be more dangerous than a 2 plus token right yeah so I had like all of the tokens and um, I realized okay that was too obvious so I removed some of the tokens and that was more interesting um, but then um, it shifted back into this like okay guessing game it was just like guessing um, once you turn over all the cards that were had the tokens on them you were guessing but then like I had like this idea okay um, okay what if you can if they you can, you can set um, intermediate goals right so I had this idea of um, completing rows and columns basically uh, to unlock more tokens and you know that's where basically the game basically came together and 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 we got what we have right now and the idea of stabbing something was there from the beginning I really liked the idea of like, stabbing a card but I wasn't sure um, you know how you what the normal way of winning the game was and you know I eventually arrived at this part where it's like you if you turn over all of the cards then the vampire gets stabbed automatically I also were, were able to bring back this cheating idea or of this you know using the fact that somebody's cheating against themselves so this is a bit of a spoiler so if you want to skip this part then skip to this time code that I will show right now <laughs> um, so um, uh, late in a uh, very like the final um, vampire that you unlock is this that's Orlock and I made um, at the end I made him a bit more difficult than all the other vampires by challenging some of the assumptions that you kind of like take with you uh, automatically but are actually like don't have to be true so again the thing with the nine with the plus tokens is that you think that a nine plus token is more dangerous than a two plus token but it wouldn't have to be like this right it's like if the tokens were generated uh, or decide if the computer decides what to token to, to put on a card the moment you actually put the token on that card then the computer could just uh, if it's a vampire the computer could decide on any number um, and it would be still true um, there's no reason for a computer to favor a nine plus token when it's a vampire card, right? Um, and again, because of the this very complicated way, in the, the way I generate the tokens, um, and the nine plus is still more dangerous token uh, for the other vampires, and it can like feels feels right for a player. But for Orlok, it's not the way. So <laughs> for Orlok, I made sure that all of the nine, um, the probability for a vampire to appear on the token is equally distributed. Um, so basically the nine the plus tokens are almost useless there unless you can like rule it out through some other, other evidence um, and the other thing is I noticed that players were going for the box token a lot I, I, oh, I didn't I, I don't, I'm not sure if I showed the, the box token but anyway there's a box token that shows you a two by two square and the vampire must be in that square and that's a very powerful token and I had to nerf it a lot to make sure to for it to make sense in the game um, but still like a like a dominant strategy was just to always gun for that token first and then activate it and that would uh, eliminate all of, a lot of possibilities um, and so what Orlok does is uh, he, he there's a higher chance that the vampire is going to be in the row or column that belongs to that token. So if players always go for that token first, they will lose in the long term. And of course, again, 
because you, if you know that, if you know that Orlok is cheating this way, like not distributing the tokens randomly, then you can exploit it and then you can be sure that the cards that are not in a row or column uh, of, the, of the box token, that these are safer on, on average. It's not a, a sure thing, but on average they're a little bit safer. Anyway, back from the spoiler, welcome back. <laughs> so yeah, there was a bit of a way of getting this cheating as, um, and exploiting assumptions thing from the gambling enemy, getting this a little bit back in here. And that's something I would love to get more in, uh, in this, uh, maybe a sequel if I continue working on this somehow. But yeah, that's something I have to like think about. And if you have any suggestions, guys, let me know. Uh, would be you're here. Okay, so um, what was development? Well, again, I had a very long pre-production phase and I was like, I wasn't working because, you know, designing and coming up with ideas is not something you can really rush, not something you can like, power through. Uh, and I'm not really in a situation where I can power through things anyway. So uh, yeah, I was, uh, I, it didn't go as quickly as I hoped it would. Um, uh, and again, my assumption was that I would create like a prototype and I would figure out the entire game and just then just like use two weeks I have left to just um, uh, rush the development. And that kind of worked. Like um, I kind of figured out mo figured out most of the stuff pretty well. Um, I had a prototype, like a very simple prototype, created a very simple prototype in the first month. And um, all of the game mechanics were basically the same as in the final version, so that was good. Um, something I underestimated uh, still uh, during development is, and I always underestimated, is how much effort UI costs, how much time UI costs. Um, just designing the UI, just sitting down and creating a screenshot of UI of like this screen here, that takes such a long time. And then implementing it in the game, like all of the lines and, you know, the, the, has to take data from different sources and you have to create data structures and everything has to be animated and you know I'm also insane so I animate everything and make the nice transitions between the different menus so uh, yeah that cost, cost a lot of time that was most of the time spent on that um, yeah so that, that was a bit of rush to development cycle and didn't feel very well uh, I had to get again I had to do one one night one nighter and I wasn't sleeping on the other nights very well either um, and at the deadline for a game by its cover the game wasn't fully complete there were some features miss missing the different vampires were um, were all the same there was no like progression system happening and some uh, narrative stuff was missing and because I had everything rushed I accrued uh, what's called technical debt so technical debt is if you have to like quickly do some kind of solutions and you don't have time to think it through or organize things then um, you are left with like bad solutions and then you build on top of those bad solutions and you have to like work around of problems that you had like underneath and then like going back and it's, it's difficult to change the thing underneath because other things are dependent on it already um, and then you get like very inefficient code or very complicated code that's very difficult to understand what's happening and very token <laughs> and in my case very token inefficient code so all of the transitions and all the menu stuff is like very convoluted and very not efficient and I'm suffering a lot <laughs> under this so I'm like very maxed out on the tokens not too much but like what do we have um, 7957 yeah so not too many tokens left not not to include like be able to include huge features and um, and yeah so like now of course like adding more features to this uh, would require me to do like a token pass so that's a bit of an issue oh, but I would be able to save a lot of tokens if I did like a proper rewrite of some of the systems here I'm um, not sure if I'm going to continue development on this too much. Uh, there's one feature I, I maybe I want to get in, in there as well, uh, still. Um, yeah, but overall I wanted to also like the, one of the reasons why I want to make like a more small game that is kind of like with simple rules with, with few cards. Maybe that's something I should have mentioned earlier. Is I really wanted to make something that's suitable for the token limit because that's something I ran out, ran into previously. And um, and I think generally it worked out. Like this is a not well-sized game for Pico 8. I didn't run into token issues until the very, very end. And um, you know, again, it was my fault. If I made some of the menus simpler, then I wouldn't have any problems at all. It was well-sized for Pico 8, and so on. So I was very happy with that. 
Um, some technical stuff, if I press escape and you can see that the color changes, that's because um, I use the alternative, uh, alternate color palette and I have a video about this right here coming up. <laughs> um, so the alternate color palette is like this thing where um, there's like more colors, darker colors available if you do some hacking uh, for Pico 8. And um, in this case, um, I use some of the additional red shades to get like more, you know, to get more flexibility in the, in, the, in the color palette here. It's not exactly the, obviously not exactly the colors that um, we had in the original, um, in, the, in the original design um, of the card, you know, on, on the family case. But I think it captures the, the spirit. I mean, there's just so much you can do with the Pico 8 colors. You can't really change the shade of the of the red, and it, fi it works fine. Like it's. It's okay. It, it looks the the red on the card image looks a bit more paler, and I think that's kind of like fits into this idea that it's a printed version of the game, and then the game in-game stuff is more vibrant because you know it's a digital version. Um, so it was good. It was good to have like a big project um, that actually specifically uses the alternate color palette. I, I developed like some techniques of how to work with it. Maybe that's something I'm going to talk about later. But yeah, it was a bit difficult keeping track of which color is which now because usually I just like you know press escape and look up here. It's like okay, which color number is what. Um, but that wasn't really possible anymore. And then if you prepare images, um, like here, like here is the shot glass from the intro, right? Or here, like if you die, you, there is like this. Uh, image of like two people toasting with um, with your blood and you can see like the colors are crazy here um, because th I'm using some additional shades of red and so I wasn't able to get like an image in Photoshop and just import it immediately I would have to always go through an extra process of exchanging the shades of red I used against other um, colors and that slowed me down a little bit and I still have to think, find a good uh, efficient process of doing this very quickly maybe like some kind of macro on um in photoshop would be would be enough but yeah that's something to think about in the future and this wasn't so bad right now because there weren't too many colors involved but if i change the color palette completely that would be a bit of a problem um so yeah one thing that people ask me about is how i made the card flip animation so i mean i mean this is this animation is, I don't think, is very complicated. I think everybody would be able to complete this. Um, the, although I have to say, like the fact that the circles are getting th uh, thicker as as you go to the uh, outer circles, I do, I basically write um, draw two circles, uh, a red circle and a smaller black circle, and that's how you get you can create circles with with thickness. Um, yeah, so we have the, the vampires in here. Um, the vampires were uh, like, if, <laughs> so for the first vampire I had was this vampire. That was like my placeholder for a very, very long time, uh, and that's the vampire from the from the creepy pasta from the Russian sleep experiment creepy pasta. <laughs> I thought that was a really good, creepy image, and so I basically just took that and scaled it down and put it into P8. Um, as people still recognize it as a, some people recognize it as a creepy pasta. Uh, so that was good, but then I also realized like, okay, I, I have to have like more faces like this. And so my process was taking some random uh, stock photography of people, like portraits of people, and then making them black and white, and then going to Photoshop and like ex exaggerating the um, the faces with like liquify filter. I still have the images there, they look hilarious though. But I'm not gonna show it. If you see the original images, it will spoil the effect. The cool thing is if you scale them faces down to this small size, um, your imagination starts kicking it and starts filling in the blanks because you don't really see the details anymore, so your imagination starts kicking in and they get a lot creepier, I think, than if you saw the original images. Um, so yeah, that's it. So the card flipping animation. So initially, I actually I want wanted to be a bit of a test of all of the different techniques I am using, and uh, so I want to maybe try T line, um, but then I gave up very very quickly. And um, so what this is happening when you turn off the card uh, over the card? I want to make sure that this looks nice. That this is really you know fun to uh, to watch the cards being turned over. And so what happens here, maybe I would show you a slow down version of it. Um, the card gets um, skewed. Um, so like basically like um, 
uh, you, I draw the card line uh, column by column, pixel column by pixel column using SS Bright, so SSPR. Uh, so I draw the first column of the card, second column of the card, third column of the card, and so forth. And then I move the columns up, so the the card gets kind of like diagonal, basically, right? And as it gets diagonal, uh, I move it up also a little bit. And then once it gets so diagonal that oh, and also I squish the card. And when it gets more diagonal, I, the more diagonal it gets, the more I squish it together. Um, and then once it gets uh, turns into a line, I basically then I change the, the image on the card and then squish it and make it diagonal the other way around. So it looks like it's it's being turned, uh, but you know as if you looked at it from uh, from like a certain perspective, like if you turn it like this. Um, and then there's a little nice little detail of flourish is where um, when it flips on the other side when it like returns back to the to the uh, to the face up position for a couple of frames I make the card the, all the colors on the card a little bit lighter so the black becomes a, 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 a blue and the dark uh, red becomes a brighter shade of red. Um, and that looks a little bit like um, the card caught some reflection from a from a light above, and that really sells the idea that you know, the cards are being flipped. And the fact that you move them around up, and there's like a shadow that they throw on the ground. There's like a lot of effects to that contribute to this to this thing. And because it goes so quickly, and there's like a sound effect associated with it, it it's very satisfying and it feels very nice. Yeah. The sound effect that um, that was created by Gruber Music, and that's an amazing sound effect. I love it so much. I'm kind of shocked that he was able to produce the sound effect in uh, Pico 8. He did such a good job. Also, like, uh, this menu music is one pattern. It's one pattern. This entire music, it's still, like, it's going, and it's still one pattern. It's still one pattern now. <laughs> it's crazy. Oh, he does it. He's, he's a genius. And then, yeah, um, during the game, as I said, um, when we are playing, you know, this is like just the baseline right now. So this, is, so we have um, uh, Groove Music composed like a sequence of multiple patterns, not just loop and sequence. Uh, and um, uh, he used all four channels for the music. And I basically use a poke and peak, or I guess only poke, um, as I described in the uh, memory uh, video, uh, I'm using poking into the memory to turn off uh, all of the channels and all of the um, patterns that belong to the to music, except for the bass. So now the bass is off, and then when I flip over some cards, um, I turn on one channel. And whenever you do that, you know, uh, the music loops through one pattern and uh, the new channel comes in on the next pattern. So that's why there was a little bit of delay. It didn't turn on immediately, but it waited until uh, the currently running pattern was completed and then you heard a new uh, channel. So as you continue, more and more channels get turned on. Let me see if I can get the whole music. And that was actually interesting. That was a bit of a challenge. We um, Because on, a, on, a, uh, on early experiments, we had the situation where um, he composed music that where you if you started turning on single channels it um, there were like sudden jumps in complexity or on drama and that didn't, that didn't sound so good so we had to like recompose the music a little bit so um, it sounded like a gradual increase when you turn on the, the different channels so you can see that you know more and more music elements come in as more and more channels of this loop get activated Uh, there's a similar. Um, oh man, I'm so I'm so, I'm, I'm so unlucky right now. Oh, it's a game of luck. Hmm, let's do it. Oh, that was bad. I wanted to put on a seven. Well, let's do it. Bam. So um, yeah. So we. Um, you activate the individual channels of the music, and at the, uh, at the end of the uh, last two cards or so, you heal all channels at the same time, and then you 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 know the, you, 
hear the entire composition, the, the full composition, but otherwise you hear only like the bass or just bass and, and some music instruments. We kind of like experiment a, little, a lot about hitting the right tone because uh, we wanted it to be spooky, but we didn't want it to be unpleasant. So that's it was a bit difficult. We had multiple had to do multiple re revisions until we hit the right kind of feel. Um, the, in, the final inspiration, and you might hear it now that, that I tell you this, um, was actually um, Phoenix Wright. Uh, there is some Phoenix Wright tracks which are like very dramatic, but also like this pumping sound that is very addictive, like very pleasant to hear, but also like dramatic and intense. Uh, and yeah, because like some early experiments we had were like very spooky and creepy. And I was worried that if, if people will listen to this sound a lot, right? Like if they, people will play this game, will hear this music a lot. And I, I didn't want to get tired of it that quickly. Or I didn't want to be like, like oh no, like turn this this, this you know, sound on it, like gets under under my gets me on my nerves, you know. So I wanted to, to feel like 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 a struggle for, for victory a little bit. More positive, more poppy, a little bit than, than uh, like a, some of the horror music, typical horror music. Um, yeah, okay. So this is this is all my technical notes. Um, uh, oh yeah, and there's no, there's one more. Uh, so um, one technique I used in here a lot is is I used um, uh, the memory. I used RAM. So again, using the, the techniques I described in my memory video, I the way I generate the cards is at the beginning of the game, you can see there here's one card. There's no other cards in this entire sprite sheet, right? There's no cards, there's just one card here. So what I do here, the, the card is just placeholder, by the way. Um, so what I do here at the beginning is I, um, I generate the cards. Uh, I have like this heart symbol here and I have like a, uh, array of you know where to place the cards and where to print the number and you know how, how do you arrange the hearts when it's two the two and three and fourth and so forth and so I generate the cards and I take the image of the cards line by line and I put them into the RAM the m part of the memory that's not used by Pico 8 or anything and so I save the cards basically in RAM and then later on when I draw the cards I can I load them into these from RAM into this area, back into this area here. And then I can SSPR from here, from this area. And I do this, you know, then I, I draw like the six and, and put it on the screen. And then if I have to draw the seven, I get the, get the seven from the memory and put it into this area and so forth. And also something that you might be, you might notice is that the, ca uh, the card packs are also randomly generated. So now you have like these, I don't know, like now you have like this E, E3 in the middle, right? So I restart the game, and now it's a different card pack. And again, that's something I started, uh, a technique I developed on working on my chance sweet buns, uh, because I wanted to do that already in my chance sweet buns and it didn't work. I didn't have the tokens for it. Uh, but basically, you, uh, <laughs> the way you do is, it, it's sound, wow, it sounds like, it looks amazing, right? But um, it's very easy, it's, um, uh, it's just a random pattern, just like using random, like if, you know, R&D is smaller than 0 0.5, then it's dark pixel, otherwise it's a bright pixel. But then it's mirrored uh, on two axes, so like, uh, like, like this and then this, you know. And because it's mirrored, uh, a random pattern will look very deliberate, like a carpet. And that's that's all. that's the entire trick. It's a very easy way to make a really good looking card pack. Because otherwise, if you do it and want to do it intentionally, it's actually very difficult to pull it off. It's very funny. Like if you want to do a really good card pack intentionally, it's pretty tough in with pixel art. And generally, making cards with pixel art is pretty tough. Um, so I think this is the smallest size you can get away with. I think for the cards to be readable, and they only readable as hearts. That's why I have like different card suits here, but um, the other card suits need more pixels vertically than the heart. And so I never made it work. And even then, the this the uh, I'm not sure that's the cross, I guess, right? That doesn't look right. That's not, that's not really well recognizable. So yeah, it's, cards with pixel art are really tough. <clears throat> so yeah, finally, I also uh, want to talk a little bit about the the feedback I received so far. So um, 
it's really funny or in or interesting to hear that um, generally positive feedback is very positive. <clears throat> a lot of people say it's addictive and well, I guess I, 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 I thought it would be addictive. It's, I'm not really that happy about the addictive part because, um, again, it's, I feel it's a bit manipulative and I don't really feel that, that well about this. Um, but uh, it confirms my suspicion that it works, <laughs> that, that this apparent conditioning still works. So I'm not really sure if they like it, if it's addictive because it's a fun game or if it's because, you know, because of the randomness involved. But yeah, uh, people like it a lot. Um, um, negative feedback, like one of the most consistent negative feedbacks is that people get upset about the early flips. Um, so, so let's talk about this. So um, first of all, the game starts with the, and it automatically flips a card. That's weird, right? Because I could also start a game with no cards flipped. And actually, if you look at um, uh, Minesweeper, they do a really cool trick there. So in Minesweeper, <clears throat> you also start with, a, with the entire card co um, map covered, and then you have to click once. And, and on the first click on the Minesweeper, you never get the um, the mine. You never uh, click on the mine on the first click, because what Minesweeper actually does is, you, uh, when the entire map is hidden, there is no map generated. There is no the locations of the mines are not generated. You click on somewhere and then it generates the mines around your click. So it assumes that where you clicked is no mine and then it puts the mines in all of the other places. So it generates the level after you clicked for the first time, not before. So that's why on your first click you never can get the mine. I could do something similar here as well. I was thinking about this. The problem here is first of all yeah, you get the tokens on the sides and I cannot generate the tokens. Um, or I could I guess but I would, would feel weird. Um, and the second reason is um, Minesweeper doesn't really make much difference because the, the map is so big, but in this game the map is so cl so small, uh, people might always click on certain places because there are strate strategically more advantages. So they might always click in the middle, so they don't have a vampire in the middle, because the middle is, is a better place to start with, to have no vampire or to at least have an uncovered card in. Or they might always click on the row or column with a box token because they want to go for the box token. So I am, um, in order to force the player to uh, work with a changing uh, starting position, I um, take that decision away from them. I uncover the first card. Um, and also for the generation of the tokens, it's also important that one card is uncovered. <laughs> um, but yeah, so one card is always uncovered. And the other thing is, um, so yeah, so people are upset if now if you if you turn over a card and that card, the first card that you turn over, one of the first cards that you turn over, <laughs> it's just my luck. Just when I want to show something, I, of course I do this, this wrong. But yeah, people um, are upset about uncovering a vampire early. So if I cl click now, it's a vampire. And of course I knew it because there was a 9 plus here, but if um, they click on some random card with no token and it was a vampire, and people would get very upset about this. And there are some a couple of negative comments in here. And people suggested, that, oh, maybe you should like tweak the percentages, or, like rearrange the cards uh, underneath so the early cards are less likely to be a vampire. And I don't like this idea. And actually the game already has a system that deals with it, right? So the idea is that stakes are raising, are getting higher as you flip over more cards. So uh, encountering a vampire early means that you lose less money than if you had encountered the vampire later down the line. That would mean you would lose more money. And still you get like those comments where people say like, oh, I played this game and I covered uncovered the vampire on my first draw three times in a row and that's why I lost the entire game and I'm like asking what happened to the other games right because like if you had won the other two games then you would have easily made back the money that you lost by uncovering the vampire on your first click uh, but of course they're not thinking about the other games because the other games felt more like they had this you know they had a say in them because you know they went for longer so they lost because of the other games that's where they really lost the, the, the money because you know they uncovered more 
cards and there was more at stake so the losses were greater but it feels like the first flip a vampire is unfair because you had no ch chance you're right you just clicked on somewhere you were going on a win and you had really bad luck it feels unfair so i'm not sure how to deal with this if you have any like ideas on how to lessen this impact it's, it's just an impression thing right it's not not an actual physical like it's not actually like the game is already making sure that these unfair flips are still have very little uh, material impact on the game like again flipping a vampire on your first click is the best thing that can happen the best kind of loss if you're a, if you were to flip a vampire you want to flip a vampire early on so i'm not sure what to do here maybe you know the first three th three flip flips are um cost you no stakes or i don't know i'm not sure what to do there it's it's a bit difficult something i am I'm actually thinking about you know how to address in the possible sequel or whatever um I had some comments of people who wanted to be Sudoku, more Sudoku-like, having more tools to actually narrow down where the vampire is. And that's actually... I'm actually disagreeing with those people. I think this is this is something that's beautiful about this game, that in the end it's a coin flip, right? So um, you can see this more better. I guess I haven't unlocked the second one. You can see it when once you get the, the box token, where it's like... The game often comes down to a coin flip, like you can flip over the cards and it's fine. Um, but so which one is it now, right? See, it's what often you you clear the entire board, and it's often down to just two cards, and quite often you actually don't have the tokens to that to to figured out because you're always going for them the tokens tell you where the cards are but you always go for the low value cards because they are safer so the higher value cards are often stay on the board for a longer time and and um, it's very difficult to resolve um, where the vampire is if you only have higher if only the higher value cards are um, hidden um, because for example this compare token like putting it on a three is useless because there's very few cards that are smaller than a three. There's just a two that is smaller. Um, if you put on an eight, like this is very useful information right now because I know that this is a nine or the vampire. And there's already nine plus here. So, okay, I already identified where the big value cards are. So I can like very safely flip over all the cards here. Um, so this was a very useful token here right now. But um, yeah, putting it on a two, like right now, the, the, this compare token is useless because I, I know this is bigger than a two. I already know that. I don't like the, the putting in, comparing a hidden card, big hidden card, to a two is useless for me. Um, and I like that, that that you can never narrow it down in the end, right? Like the, that you can always, that you're always forced to do the gamble thing when there's a lot at stake. That's what the game was supposed to be. That's supposed to be a high stakes kind of game. Uh, so it comes down to a coin flip, but again, it's supposed to be a coin flip. If it's a Sudoku, then um, then that's a different kind of game. And, and it's kind of funny because the game is trying to be something that Sudoku. That you, you're supposed to play this game the way you're not supposed to play Sudoku. <laughs> And I often end up playing Sudoku like that. And you too, admit it. Too. Like sometimes you, you play Sudoku and you're supposed to find out, you know, where the numbers go. But sometimes you're just like, oh man, I just want to finish this puzzle. And I was going to assume this is a two. And then you continue. And then you hope that you guessed it right. <laughs> uh, and then of course the numbers start not aligning. Like, oh no, it wasn't the two, it was the other one. <laughs> and the same with... Uh, with uh, Minesweeper, right? Where it's like, if you start guessing in Minesweeper and you're losing the game, you're not supposed to guess uh, in Minesweeper. And in this game, you're supposed to, like this is a gambling game, you're supposed to guess at some point. Um, something else that's important here, that it's important, uh, it's possible to pass, and the people were a bit, um, like first of all, the pass function wasn't there, I think, in, the, in my in my first version, I'm not sure if it was in there. Not sure, but it took me a long time to implement the pass function. That's why it's also like in terms of layout, it's a little bit to the side, it's a little bit easy to overlook. I'm, I'm not really happy with it. I, there should have been like a big pass button underneath. I'm not really happy with the way the layout turned out. But yeah, the pass function uh, is important because if there was no pass function, it would feel like your the game is just like you know 
forcing you to make those decisions. But here you can still do the pass and take a small penalty, but you can still take away a lot of winnings. And it was an interesting decision also to find out how much to charge the player for the pass. And I think I'm, I lowballed a little bit. I think it should be a bit higher because a lot of people are using pass and are farming money. Uh, this wouldn't be a good casino game. You would never, and no casino would offer you this kind of game. It's, it, I think it's it's really bad because you can like with skill and, and strategy you can you could win in the long term. But that's the point, right? Like in the reason why in and that's I think important part. The reason why you can't, um, why Nintendo Clubhouse doesn't have the persistent money thing, where it's like you know when wins or losses from one game carry over to the next game, is that a lot of the, a lot of the casino games you can't actually win in the long term, right? If you have blackjack and you continue playing blackjack, you will eventually lose all your money. That's the casino game. That's the idea of casino games. So like having money carry from one game to another. Is, uh wouldn't work. You would just lose all your money and then you would always have to re refill your money somehow. Poker works, works better, I have to admit. Poker work, works a little better in this case because, um, again, if um, you're winning not against the house, you're not playing against the house, but you're playing against other players. So you can theoretically win in the long term. Uh, some people were very upset that you, if you lose, you lose all your progress. So, you know, you can unlock the different vampires and if you unlock the final vampire and lose all your blood against the final vampire, you go back to, like, you have to start the game from scratch and you uh, lose all your progress. And some people some people were very upset about this, but I, which I understand, like, this is... Um, this sucks <laughs> in many ways. Um, but again, that was, like, something very deliberate and very important for me. To, um, like, you have to have... There has to be a lot at stake because that's the idea of the game. Like this, is, you know, you're playing for your life here. Um, and if you know losing, uh, you, if you could recover easy from a loss, if it was not, not not a big deal of losing all of your, your blood because you can just like start out playing against Orlok from the beginning. Then um, then you would bet more carelessly and you would second guess yourself less about making outrageous guesses and um, and that wouldn't be a good depiction of, of gambling and, and you know, the thrill of gambling because the thrill is you know making the outrageous bets and getting away with it that's the real thrill and it definitely works and it also works if you lose i think because you know again at, at, at the end of the day it's there's there's no money involved it's fine it's very safe um but still like the losses can feel feel bad something i don't like about this personally is that the betting is still not good so uh, i would not talked about it earlier um, a lot of the gambling games a lot of the casino games are the betting is the whole deal the whole point and um, I don't like uh, I never figured out a good way to do the betting in this game and it's not good so you raise the stakes right you raise, raise the stakes by flipping cards and it happens, happens automatically you, it's not a conscious decision or at least you don't think about it too much you just like the point of the game is the flipping cards so I'm gonna flip the cards right um, and so, for example, that's different from a blackjack, where in blackjack you bet and then you get the card. Like, that's two different things that you do in, in this game. Um, so yeah, if I make a sequel, I would probably think about how to integrate, how to make the betting a separate step, maybe somehow, but I'm not sure how to do this. <clears throat> initially, there was a, the mechanic was that you would um, actually get different amounts of, of, in, in your, uh, of stakes. Uh, depending on what kind of token you picked up. So the number on the token would be the stakes that you get. So if you uh, flip over a card with a 9 plus token, that's how many stakes you would get. So like going for dangerous flips would give you more uh, more, uh, more blood. Um, but that was bad um, because you know the, you wouldn't pay attention and you would just the stakes would go like very high and some, flipping some cards would make no difference. Like a, flipping a two would would make no sense, or would make no difference. But flipping an eye would be this huge big deal. Um, so yeah, I had to remove that part. And so I'm still not sure how to uh, how to make the backing really nice and, and good. I'm not sure. 
Uh, I do like this, the stab. That, that, that's pretty fun. <laughs> See? <laughs> oh, damn it. Uh, but that's good. And I do like the bonus round. The bonus round feels like, the, like, like good gambling because it's like, okay, you have to decide, do I want to go double or nothing? And you put a lot on the line and if... You, know, you want like, oh, I could win so much, and you click on yes, and then you're like, oh no, what did I do? <laughs> so yeah, that's, uh, that feels good, it feels like like a good moment. I would love to have this moment more integrated into the, into the actual game. Um, one thing that I were talking about the stake is the stake is confusing. Um, the number, the bonus number, is the way it's derived is confusing and... Uh, I don't know how to make it more clear. So the idea is, like, and maybe that's part of the th part, the thing that you f you, the stakes are being raised as you flip cards. So the number on here is always how much you would get if you flip all of the cards except with Vampire, plus six at the beginning of the game, and then it gets smaller as you flip over cards. And it's six because I didn't want to have uh, at the end a situation where you have two cards left and still are able to get a bonus with a stake. Um, because then, if you have only two cards left, there would be no reason not to use the stake. Um, and so I want to like the final moment for you to use the stake and still get some additional points as opposed to just flipping over the cards is when there's three cards left. When there's two cards left, you know, you're down to just flipping the cards. Um, because I always wanted the stake to be something that, that is, you know, a more dangerous version of just flipping over the cards individually. Um, but yeah, that's, this complicated system is not, like, this never explained anywhere, and I don't know if it should be explained. It's just like a random number here, and it's not really clear why the stakes go away. It's, it always goes down, go down by two now, because it always takes into consideration how many cards you would have flipped. It's, the math behind it is very complicated. It lose me myself at some point, and it's, as you can tell, it's very difficult to explain, and it would be nicer if, if there was some kind of, like, something that's more immediate, more clear to explain to some people. I'm not sure what, how to do this. Now, uh, yeah, so that's something I'm also thinking about. Um, and the final thing, and that's something I would definitely think about, is how to make the value of the cards more meaningful. Um, that's something I was thinking about early on. Again, I was thinking about maybe if the, the value of the card that you flip is added to the stakes. But again, that was the same with, like, with the tokens, not good. Um, so yeah, I, I, I maybe you know you have to flip over certain or collect certain values to unlock something else. Maybe you know if you flip over the every turn you get a card, and if you flip over that card, then you get maybe an additional token or something. There is um uh, right now the numbers on the cards are almost meaningless. It's basically just either a card with number or the vampire. It's just like that's the biggest dif the differentiation, and uh, you know. If it's a 5 or a 2, it doesn't really make make much more difference. You do pay attention if it's the 8 or 9, because these are the high value cards. And, you know, those are... That's where where you get closer to the vampire. But, you know, the difference between a 4 or a 3 is like... Who cares? And it would be interesting if it, it was important, if it was a 4 or a 3. If you, the, that part was um, important also in some, some kind of way. So, again, maybe you're collecting the, the, the values somehow. I'm not sure. It, it would be good if there was something else. And yeah, also thinking about how to do to add other tokens yet. There's still one idea that I had is it would be nice if the vampire sometimes put a value token, like a plus one stake token on some of the cards. It's like I dare you to flip this card. Like if you flip this card you get additional stake. Um, but if it's a vampire you that stake gets uh, like to get like more of the gambling part maybe in the game. I thought that would be a good idea and would also like include the vampires more uh, as an antagonist because maybe he would like comment something as, uh, as well. But that's definitely a feature that I'm not really I probably don't have the tokens for. So that's definitely something that we would have to do for a sleep or something. I'm not sure. Yeah, so that's all I had for for high stakes, I think. 
it's it was a fun project. I really love it a lot. Um, I want to still continue working on this and adding. Um, so the feature I'm, I'm missing is like on this main screen. There's really nothing to do. Just continue or start a new game. I want to add a feature to uh, reset the game. Usually you don't need it, but you know maybe you want to show to your friend how the intro looks like, right? So yeah, you, you always want to have an option to delete the save game and start from scratch. And if I add that menu, I also want to have like a boss rush mode, basically. So if you uh, complete the game once, like play through the game once, and unlock all of the vampires, then I want to have like an option to be able to just play a vampire without, just like play a vampire and then try to get as much of a high score as possible without you having to, without this persistent blood uh, amount. Uh, so basically like an infinite mode, because right now what people want to do is they just want to play the game over and over again. And you know, if you get 5000 blood, you get reset to the, f to the first table again, and you have to unlock all the tables again from scratch. And th they might want to be just play it all like over and over again. So, um, so yeah, I want to add maybe this infinite mode. I think it doesn't shouldn't be that difficult. So yeah, this is high stakes um, played. Um, again, I, I, I will add some more features, but it's basically done right now. And I want to um, all I want to do now is to get it up on uh, new grounds to see how people on new grounds will think about this. Um, but yeah, that will take some uh, a week or so to get get running there because you know, there is all achievements and stuff like that you have to get in there. Uh, let me know what you think, if you have any ideas uh, of the problems that I discussed, um, what your impressions of the game was. I'm, I'm always excited to hear what you, what you guys uh, have to say about these games. Um, in this game, I especially, I did very little playtesting because everything was so rushed. So it would be really good to hear from people what they, what they thought. Yeah, play this game. It's a fun game. I, I, I had a blast working on this and I think it came out really nice. Uh, yeah. So yeah, um, coming up is I still have some um, uh, the next memory video the, about some secret memory functions. Uh, I have a still a video that I want to prepare. And then obviously I'm still working on uh, the next tutorial, but that's something that's going to be coming in the far, far future. See you next time everyone, guys. Bye bye.